I'd like to address the question, what are the best settings for this monitor? And by best, I mean settings which work for me and that please my colour emitter, the targets I like to follow in my reviews, and that work on my unit. Of course, different units, individual preferences, this will all vary. So these are just a suggestion. These are what I use for my test settings in the review. So the first thing to be aware of with this monitor, if you make changes to any of the presets, it will then knock you into mode user. This isn't if you make any change, this is just if you make changes to things which can be set in each preset. So there are some settings which are set universally and will apply to all presets. That won't knock you into user mode, but don't worry too much about if it does or doesn't. I'll give you some examples of settings which are set universally shortly. But the idea is if you make some changes here, it could even be something simple like changing the brightness and you just want to be able to quickly recall the preset and you don't want to worry about it not saving your changes. When it knocks you into the user mode, it says save settings to, and that allows you to save it to game mode action, game mode racing, and sports. So if I go into modes, which I have my hotkey set to, which is something I explored earlier in the OSD video, you can see there's action, racing, and sports, also called G1, G2, and G3. So these are basically your main sets of settings saved there. Action G1 is actually what I use for my test settings. I set brightness to 36 because that is an appropriate level for the 160 nits that I typically target when I review monitors. This is something you would set according to your own preferences and lighting environment, however. You also want to make sure that max brightness is set to on. If this is set to off, then it will limit the monitor's brightness to, I think it's about 60 nits, it's really dim. So if the monitor looks super dim, even though you've got your brightness set to 100, that would be why. Contrast, I'd recommend leaving at the default of 50. That should be optimal. Low blue light is something you might want to use if you want to create a more relaxing viewing experience. It's something that I like to use in the evenings and the hours leading up towards bed. And I actually have that set to sports or G3 so I can quickly activate that. But what I've actually done here, it's set up in the same way as my test settings except that low blue light is set to level 4. Actually I believe the brightness might be a tiny bit higher than my test settings. I don't think that was actually intentional but that's easily rectified. So I can just Reduce that a little bit to 36 because I don't mind that. Save settings to sports. Be aware as well that if you're using a low blue light setting like this and you've got the brightness set as you did before, then it will actually be dimmer because the low blue light settings make color channel adjustments which reduce your contrast and reduce your brightness. And that's all explored in the vision review in the contrast and brightness section. Also be aware that when I first set my test settings up, so I'm just going to go back to my test settings action, I actually used standard, the standard preset as the base. So anything that I'm not talking about here that I haven't changed, that was just set as default in the standard setting. I'm just going to quickly talk about some of the other settings. So there's eco, this is just quite dim by default. Actually, it's not dim, it's dimmer than standard by default, but it's not as dim as I like to have things. So it's not as dim as my own test settings, meaning that technically my test settings use less power than eco. But that's basically all it does. Graphics, and that sets to a high brightness by default. 97 for some reason. I don't know why they didn't just go all the way up to 100, but 97 it is. And remember, if I change this, it then knocks me into mode user, and I would have to save my preferred settings to save settings too. And there's HDR, which is actually important, and that is a preset you have to use when you're using HDR on the monitor. Gamma 2.2 was good on my unit, Colour temperature, I set that to user. That was set to warm by default using standard. And actually that was quite well balanced, but I still wanted to make a few changes just to get things closer to my 6500K target and have a really nice neutral green channel. So for me, red gain was set to 48, green gain 48, and blue gain 50, which is the default. The bias controls also set to the defaults. These kind of shift the gamma curve of the colour channels. It's not something I'd recommend most people play around with, but if you like to tweak things like that and you like to make some slight changes and you prefer how things look with the bias settings changed, then by all means do that. So to give an example of an extreme adjustment, it now gives everything a strange red tint, as if a very odd filter is applied. But really the gain controls are the main RGB controls. Most monitors will just have RGB the main three colour channels, and they're your gain controls. So they're the main ones to focus on. I also left 
the color space in standard. If you want to use sRGB emulation, so you want to restrict your color gamut, you don't want oversaturation for standard sRGB applications, you don't want to be using ICC profiles, you don't want to worry about any of that, and you might not be using color aware applications which would use them anyway, you can set that to sRGB. And with this, it does gray out some settings. You can adjust the brightness according to your preferences, however. It seems to set super sharpness to on. That really just over sharpens the image. It can be useful for non-native resolutions if you're using them, but if you're using the native 4K UHD resolution, I would recommend just setting super sharpness to off. This monitor has an excellent pixel density, lots of sharpness natively. You don't really need to enhance that or over sharpen that. Other thing to be aware of, if you've changed the color space to sRGB, you can't change the color channels. So I can't scroll up here and get to the color channels. So now I cycle back to standard. It's just actually knocked me into standard mode, which isn't what I was using before. So it does take a little bit of getting used to this OSD. It's the same on other Acer monitors, so I am used to it. So that's why you should be saving things to G1, G2, or G3. It just makes it easier to recall settings. So to quickly recap, I changed the brightness. I was using standard as my base. I made sure max brightness is set to on. Made some changes to the color channels. Other settings of interest under gaming, there's an overdrive setting and my recommendation there is to set that to normal and see how you find it. If you find that the overshoot's too high, then set that to off. If you have FreeSync Premium Pro active, so you want to be using VRR, specifically you want to be using Adaptive Sync, then that grays out the overdrive control and it's locked at normal. And it always locks it at normal, or it behaves like normal anyway. Adaptive dimming, and that's something which is explored in some detail in the written review and also explored in the video review. I have that set to off the desktop because I don't like to use this kind of setting on the desktop. It's, it's the local dimming solution, the 576 zone local dimming. I like to set this to average when I'm gaming casually under SDR. I like to have this set to average always under HDR as well. And if I'm watching video content under SDR, sometimes I have this on average as well. Kind of just depends how I feel, to be honest. Remember, I'm still in SDR now. You can adjust the brightness. I'd recommend setting it to a similar value you had before. And if you want things to be more dynamic and you don't mind a bit of extra brightness, you can drag that up. But this is all explored again in more detail in the review. I would also generally recommend setting auto source to off. I know I mentioned this before, but that was actually a little bit before I started talking about the best settings. This monitor has a lot of different ports. It seems to sometimes slowly cycle through them before choosing the appropriate port, and it just takes a little bit of extra time. So if you have this set to off, it should start up quicker. It doesn't always do this cycling, I've noticed, but sometimes it does, and it can get a bit annoying, to be honest. So I would recommend manually selecting the port if you can. HDMI black level, that should be set to normal by default. Leave it there unless you're using a system which needs a limited range RGB signal, perhaps a Nintendo Switch, I think they work better with a limited range RGB signal, in which case you can set that to low. Interesting, I'm actually using DisplayPort and it still has the HDMI black level control, but regardless of whether I'm using a full range or limited range signal with DisplayPort, this doesn't have any effect, so it should really be greyed out. But it isn't, never mind, just leave it on normal anyway. Quick start mode is another thing you might want to have enabled. If you have this disabled, which is the default state, it's going to turn the monitor off. I'm turning on now. It does take a little bit of time to switch on this monitor. It then displays these little... You saw it displayed the logo. And if I had automatic port selection enabled, it might have also taken even longer because it might have cycled through the ports before it found the correct one, which can be quite annoying. So I'm just going to turn quick start mode on. I'm now turning the monitor on. It still takes a bit of time. It doesn't make it super quick, but it doesn't display those logos and it is a bit quicker to start up. HDMI 2.1, it's just a little trick here I will mention. I did notice once when I was using HDMI 2.1 on the monitor, for some reason I could only select 160 hertz and that was the only listed resolution. It's like it had scrambled the EDID somehow. If I turned HDMI 2.1 off then on again, it had all the correct resolutions listed. I haven't noticed it doing this again, so I'm not sure what caused that behavior. I was using my AMD GPU and I just plugged my Nvidia GPU in again, so it could have been that that caused some issue temporarily, but this was cleared by simply switching HDMI 2.1 to off then on again. Then it had the full range of refresh rates listed. And just the final thing we need to pay attention to is DSC. 
You will want to use that for the full capability of the monitor if you're using DisplayPort. Switching over the attention to HDR now, I'm just going to turn that on in Windows. As of firmware version 2.00.015, which was the one that was released in June 2023, the monitor will automatically go into its HDR operating mode when an HDR signal is detected. So you'll see that for the modes, everything's grayed out except for HDR, and that's what's selected. Now, in terms of the best settings here, I would just quite happily leave everything at default, and that should be brightness set to 100. If you lower the brightness, you can do that for viewing comfort reasons, but it will upset the PQ curve of the monitor. It doesn't just map things neatly to a lower brightness. So what that means is that really everything's tuned for the brightness to be set to 100. But if for viewing comfort reasons, you really just find that too much, that is of course important. So do reduce the brightness. Quite a lot of this is grayed out, contrast, ACM, max brightness, that's all grayed out, not relevant under HDR. Black Boost, I would recommend not shifting this from the default to 5. It will upset the image and make significant changes there. You can manually disable HDR even if you've got an HDR signal by switching it off in the OSD, but there's no reason you'd want to do that. It will just give you a very dodgy image. I like to make sure that super sharpness is set to off. If you like a bit of a sharper look, that is to say an over-sharpened look, and that is common on some monitors under HDR anyway. And you can turn super sharpness on or leave it on. I'm not entirely sure what the default was. It kind of changed between firmware revisions. For color, just leaving that at color temperature warm, which is the default, works well for my unit or works well enough. You can select something else if you'd prefer. So if you notice a particular tint, you could set that to color temperature user and then make adjustments. The adjustments here though, they're applied universally. So if you make adjustments under SDR, which I've done here, they carry over to HDR if you've got color temp set to user there. Unfortunately, the calibration tends to be different in terms of white point and overall color channel balance comparing SDR to HDR. So you probably want to make different adjustments if you really want to optimize things here. So that can be quite annoying to be honest. It means you have to change this every time you go over to SDR or HDR. So it is possible but it is easier to just leave things at the default setting of warm. So try to get used to that. Hopefully it looks okay on your unit anyway. I also like to set adaptive dimming to average. This is all explored in the review, the different settings here, but I would definitely recommend at least enabling that setting under HDR. So that's really all I change. I make sure super sharpness is disabled. I make sure the brightness is set to 100 and I set adaptive dimming to my preferred setting of average.